All through the morning, every speaker who's spoken has touched on DPI and India's prowess as far as DPI is concerned. You've had international acclaim and recognition from even the likes of Bill Gates. And you had a consensus uh, at the G20 digital uh, economy meet in Bengaluru. What's next in terms of creating these into concrete collaborations and turning this into India's soft power in a global environment? So I, I think, uh, thank you for, uh, first of all, acknowledging that uh, I have a difficult uh, evening with my wife, uh, explaining that I'm not in Bangalore, but uh, uh, let me move on to the uh, topic of DPI. I think, look, one of the amazing things about the Indian presidency of the G20 has been how uh, center stage uh, the, the, the DPI conversation has become. And, you know, if you look at uh, pre the Indian presidency, the conversation about the DPI was still a very um, India-centric conversation. Uh, India was very proud, obviously, about the progress that we had made and we had built the India stack. And there were many con com countries that were interested in engaging with India. But the India case study and the the use of technology, the way India under Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji has over the last nine years, to really transform governance, to really transform democracy and the lives of Indian citizens, and create a vibrant innovation ecosystem as well, has really caught the attention in the post-COVID world of all of these countries today, including the big, powerful G20 nations. So I'm actually very pleased and happy that uh, this vision way back in 2015 that the Prime Minister had, that technology can really truly empower mm. and transform, and that India's case study of how it has done so is now beginning to catch the imagination of, and in a sense, many, many other nations want to jump onto this train of digitization and all of the collateral benefits that that digitization brings to their countries, to their people, to their economies. Mm. And you've recently said that India's public delivery mechanism will be dominated by the DPI in the next couple of years. Uh, it will be the cornerstone of all government to citizen interface. Uh, is that an ambitious target within the next two years? Do we have the systems in place for that? No, no, absolutely. I think uh, it, is a, it is certainly a vision of our Prime Minister. It was a vision in 2015, we have demonstrated on that vision uh, through a very, very uh, exciting win-win relationship with the private sector and the government and the citizen at the center of uh, that partnership. And uh, the ambition now for the government of India uh, that the Prime Minister has signaled is that we want to intensify the digitalization of the government, government and governance process. We want to expand the DPI framework to cover almost all public services mm. and, uh, and, and therefore continue to widen and expand the innovation ecosystem that in a sense uh, supports it and takes the DPI forward. One of the, uh, uh, I'll give you an example about how far and how strategically clear uh, the vision of our government and our Prime Minister is. He said way back in 2021 that he wants artificial intelligence and learning to be built into DPI, and therefore, AI for governance mm -hmm. becomes a very important use case for artificial intelligence in India. So uh, that is where we see the DPI progressing. That is where we see the India stack progressing. And uh, even if you are a bitter cynic or a, uh, the bitterest opponent of the government, you cannot but ex uh, accept and acknowledge the fact that there are countries around the world that are lining up Mm. in a sense, to say, look, can we also take this open source, very flexible, very innovative India stack, the India DPI, and customize it and implement it in our countries as well. A lot of this will also depend on how private sector startups take, innovate in terms of customized solutions for other countries in the world. Is there any concrete example? I know there were about 11 countries after the G20 meeting in Bengaluru who have agreed uh, on the DPI. Right. This one, are there any concrete agreements that we've reached in terms of enforcing uh, the India model, if I can call it that? in the rest of the world? So I want to be clear uh, we, we that we are not really enforcing any model. What we are doing today is essentially uh, turning on its head the narrative of, about technology, that technology is very expensive. Mm. 
and that technology is very exclusionary, that only the very rich countries and the very rich people can afford the luxury of digitalization. This mm. was the narrative for many years, that uh, if a country wanted to digitize, if a country wanted to create solutions, they had to go running to these big, uh, powerful technology companies that were invariably in the West. Mm. And that narrative has been turned on its head by the India DPI, because what the India DPI represents is really open source, nobody owns it, but it is available for everybody, and that there is an ecosystem of India stack developers who are startups, uh, small and medium technology companies who are there to support the implementation of the India stack or the India DPI in any geography or any new application. Mm -hmm. So we have an extremely vibrant ecosystem. And I, for those who don't uh, uh, understand the journey of DPI, I always use this example about the vision and clarity of our prime minister. If you see what the UPI is, the UPI is a use case, is a solution to solve a pressing use case of the government. For many years, people looked at India and said 100 rupees leaves Delhi, 15 rupees reaches the beneficiary, mm. because the whole process, the government pipe, is so leaky and corroded that there is so much of corruption and leakage. To solve that use case, the Prime Minister came up with JDY, then DBT, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. and you had, and then you had UPI evolve. So just understand that you have governance problems being solved, and at the same time, you have this vibrant innovation ecosystem, which has now become one of the world's biggest fintech uh, innovation ecosystem. So it is, it is the power of technology that has been discussed and debated on for years and decades. I think India has now become the preeminent country in the world to actually take technology and empower our people and at the same time create this very, very vibrant and exciting ecosystem of startups and developers to support that innovation. Uh, you know, you've observed this uh, not just as the minister, you've seen this telecom grow as an industrialist for many years. What, according to you, is that one aspect of India's story? And I'm say, asking this because there are several countries which don't know perhaps where to start. Uh, in terms of establishing both a financial infrastructure as well as a governance infrastructure. While we seem to have made great progress, what do you think is that one aspect uh, that you think has defined uh, India's move forward in this, in this area? I, I think it is not, uh, and I think the one big difference between how technology has been used and uh, viewed uh, in the post-2014 India versus the pre-2014 India is that in the pre-2014 India, the narrative about technology, and I'm not saying it's bad narrative or good narrative, was essentially about, oh, it's a great area, there's a lot of billionaires being created, lots of companies, lots of innovation, a lot of jobs, a lot of investment coming in, and it was part of the general economy, and this was a sector that was about 3 to 4% of the GDP. Post-2014, there is a conscious effort to embed technology into governance. Mm. And I always say this to audiences who don't know this. Pre-2014, India and, it, and our state governments have spent over five, six lakh crores in what, is, what has been euphemistically referred to as e-governance. So there have been multiple thousands and lakhs of crores spent by state governments on e-governance. But in 2014, there was still no platform or there was no framework. Mm. There were multiple independent solutions floating around uh, with different pe pieces of pe uh, uh, you know, people developing it. But there was no overall framework. There was no overall government of India architecture. There was no gov governance architecture. Post-2014, we had a political leader who understood the power of technology to improve governance. He made maximum governance his goal, which is our prime minister and said, how will I use technology to deliver on that? Then the two became fused, and then you had solutions like UPI, you had an Aadhaar, which was a completely redesigned, rejuvenated Aadhaar, and you had the concept of a stack, mm. which is Aadhaar, the UPI for payment, DigiLocker for storage, and all of these other layers that then uh, came up. And frankly, if that vision and that clarity and that architecture had not been put into place before the COVID pandemic in 2020, we would be really 
floundering we would be really uh, having we would be having, we would have had a very difficult time during covid but the fact that we had built this architecture built this framework and it was already impacting governance and people's lives in a very real way uh, is what uh, helped us during the pandemic and in a lot of ways today the case study of india as seen by countries of the g20 and beyond is because of how technology helped us during this one really black swan event that all of the world experience it sort of puts india at pole but rajiv as we go forward if i may use the term digital legal infrastructure yeah. or a digital legal framework is absolutely essential as we move forward now your a digital personal data protection act uh, is is a starting step to it now you have made you have mentioned and before i get into the finer aspects of the law uh, you've mentioned that it will create behavioral changes in data platforms and data companies how are we going to ensure that the transformation is not disruptive both for companies as well as consumers so so i'm 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 actually going to continue with your last question and then go into this one vira I, there are as we digitize and as we move from a country that was only about 35 uh, crore indians online we are now about 85 crore indians online and by 2025 will be 120 crore indians online largest connected nation increased and in, uh, more intense digitization of our economy uh, certainly there are two challenges that arise one is cyber security which is ensuring that our digital nagriks the 120 crore digital nagriks use the internet see the internet as safe and trusted and that there are measures of making sure that any crime or user harm on that is addressed through our cyber security framework so that is one aspect the second is certainly it is it is it is a not a secret it's a very well known fact that as much as the internet represents good there are also bad actors on the internet and one of the aspects of bad actors is is platforms essentially using personal data of digital nagriks small businesses and citizens and misusing them exploiting them creating business models out of them business businesses out of them now we believe that uh, and the prime minister has signaled very early on after the 2017 judgment of the supreme court that we need a global standard cyber law framework and one element of that is the digital personal data protection bill that you mm -hmm. refer to the twin objectives of that digital uh, personal data protection bill is one to put the break on the misuse and exploitation break as in b r a k e not b r e a k b r a k e break on that the second is much more medium to long term is to create a significant symmetry in the relationship addressing the asymmetry between citizen and the platform and therefore a bigger deeper behavioral change of accountability to those whose personal data is being used here mm. now it is certainly a different regime from where we are today it is certainly not going to be easy or quick for people to transition but the government of india has made it very clear that we do not want any abrupt disruptive transition we want the transition to be smooth mm. we want the transition to be orderly at the same time we don't want the transition to be such a long period that the citizens for whom the rights have been embedded in this bill are denied that uh, embedded in this act mm -hmm. are denied this uh, those rights so we will see we will sit with the industry we will sit with consumer groups and figure out what is an, uh, a reasonable normal period to provide for an orderly transition to this new regime of more accountability and more symmetry it's still work in progress sir of course the yeah. act just got passed by parliament and uh, we will we are in the process of talking to people we have a number of things to do the data protection board needs to be built and notified the rules need to be uh, discussed and notified and we certainly will give them a, a transition period uh, to transition transition to in a manner that is not disruptive and it's orderly so as we make that transition one of the trans uh, transition the concern that's been raised and it's a serious one is over the fact that the dpdp in a large sense uh gives enormous power for the central government both in terms of the influence it would have over a data protection board as well as exemptions that it can uh, offer and these questions have been raised to you as well uh, isn't that a genuine concern and isn't that also <laughs> important to rectify in case it has to to gain credibility for that entire structure so uh, let me just say this and I, i i don't mean to be rude or disrespectful for anybody who has a view like that but it is uh, to, to gently respond it is a wrong view 
because the the powers that have been given to the government to uh, to use are really in very narrowly defined circumstances of emergencies so if there's a national security incident you don't certainly expect the government to go to the uh, you know suspected terrorists and say can you give me your consent for your personal mm -hmm. data if there is a health pandemic and the patient's blood group is important to be seen by the hospital or the government, you certainly don't want uh, the government to go seek consent during a pandemic. If you, there is an earthquake or a natural disaster or a flood, and there's a patient who requires help or a family that requires assistance, it's certainly not the case that anybody can make that you have to go seek consent at that time. So the exceptions or exemptions, if you want to call it that, are for legitimate purposes and are for very, very narrowly defined purposes. Now, please understand that some of this argument has been put forth by people who be, believe privacy is an absolute right. Mm. In India, privacy is a fundamental right. And every fundamental right has reasonable restrictions. And those reasonable restrictions are that government to discharge its duty during a pandemic, government to discharge its duty during a natural disaster, government to discharge its duty during a national security event, will need some exceptional uh, uh, powers. And that, those powers have been very well defined, very well carved out and very well put. So that is on the, that yeah. question. On the DPB, this conversation, again, I think is because people, I, I, I would certainly request them to read it. The DPB is not a regulator. It is simply a body that adjudicates the consequences of a data breach. So if your data is with me, and I have consented to protect your data, but I breach it, sell it, accidentally, wittingly, unwittingly, the DPB is the body that steps in when you complain to it that says, Mr. X, you are therefore liable for so many crore rupees after a hearing, of course. Mm. That's all. Now, the DPB is a body that has to perform in a transparent manner and in a very open manner because the appeals of the DPB decision lie in the TD side where there's a judge who's a, a chairman. Mm. And the appeal from there lies in the Supreme Court. Mm. So I actually would like to re, uh, uh, reinforce this point that the performance of an institution like the DPP will be measured by its own conduct, its own, its own actions. And I think we should give it time. We are building these institutions for a modern age, for the India decade. Uh, we certainly, for example, have not said that it should be only retired bureaucrats who should be manning the DPP. We want more and more youngsters to come out and uh, you know, a volunteer to do two years, three years in these institutions. This is a very modern institution. We have designed it, conceived it, architected it to be a modern institution in this very, very modern space. Now, is there a reasonable chance that it will succeed? I believe yes. Is there an outside chance that there is a failure or some kind of a problem? Any institution has a chance of failure. At that point, we'll intervene and we'll strengthen the design. Okay, let me, put, let me ask you this way. I'm not persisting on this topic, but given the polarized atmosphere in the country and given the fact that there is an inherent fear of state control, is there something the government can do or communicate to ensure that the, the feeling or the perception of independence of the DPB is established? Given our history with institutions, it's important, isn't Look, it? Uh, look, I mean, I'm open to suggestions about what we can say. We can only say, look, it is independent. It will be independent. Its actions will speak for louder than it's any, any words that I can put forth. And finally, look, any legislation, anything that we do for the tech space has to continue to evolve. By definition, anything we do in the tech space is always going to be work in progress. Yeah. To believe that we have an ultimate well-designed, perfect for the next 10 years type of legislation is, is fooling yourself. Mm -hmm. so, so fair enough, if down the road we find there has to be something that is done to improve it, improve its performance, broad base, who comes in and uh, mans the DPB, we will, we will consider it. But I think at this stage to uh, jump around phraseology like accountability, independent, autonomous, I think is not to understand the fact that we have designed this to be accountable. Uh, something that is independent is not necessarily the best. Uh, something in the government is also not necessarily the worst. Now, ISRO just put Chandrayaan-3 on the moon. Uh, nobody says that ISRO should be independent and uh, ISRO should be uh, not government. So I think this, this belief that somehow we are being told to believe again and again 
that being in the government somehow means it is not good and outside the government is good. I certainly can tell you I've been 18 years in politics. I've been many years in, uh, as an entrepreneur. I don't buy that. There are great people in government, there are super people in government, there are bad people in government. And that applies to the private sector as well. So we should only look at these things through the prism of accountability and performance. And if there is a failure, the government of the day will certainly step in and fix the failure. Right. Unfortunately, not all of us have the perception from inside the government. Most of us have it from outside. But uh, Rajiv, uh, just another point not necessarily related to this, and this is in the context of law and order before I move into AI and more substantive issues as far as digital economy is concerned. Uh, in the context of law and order, one of the things that has been resorted to for law and order agencies is an internet shutdown. Uh, we've seen that in Manipur, we've seen that in Jammu Kashmir, we've seen that in Nu, for instance, when there is violence. Uh, but there is on the other hand, we are looking at building a DPI where your entire government service is dependent on the internet. Uh, there is absolutely no question of internet being a fundamental right. Is there a thinking that's on uh, to find a way out and make sure that internet shutdowns are not, uh, not essentially the way to uh, a trigger for a law and order situation immediately? So the internet shutdown or a lawful shutdown of the internet is not something that is unique to India. The UK does it. The US has done it. India has done it, many countries do it. When they're faced with a situation where misinformation and false information uh, becomes so viral, because that is the inherent attribute of the internet, that fake news and misinformation travels at a velocity of 10, 20, 30 times faster than the truth. And this is something that there are studies done, we have done the studies ourselves, and the audience that a misinformation reaches is a huge audience, Again, 10 to 100 times more than the audience that the truth and the facts get to. So there is a, like I said, the internet for many years and technology in general for many years was always seen as a power for good. Mm. And I, 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 you know, I won't tell you how old I am, but <laughs> certainly I'm old enough to know, tell you that uh, I, was a, I worked on the early days of the internet. And so it was a utopia, internet would connect all the good people in the world and all good ideas would be uh, exchanged and we would just build a better future, better world. That was the uh, construct. But we also know there are state actors, there is deliberate misinformation, there is weaponization of misinformation. We have seen this recently in the Khalistani bot uh, example, which the Washington Post uh, ex exposed. We have seen the DG ISPR in Pakistan using misinformation. So therefore, misinformation is unfortunately today one of the biggest harms and challenges for all democratic societies. Not just India, it is true for the US, it's true for UK, it's true everywhere. And weaponization of misinformation is basically the reason why internet shutdown, which is almost a last resort, hmm. is being, uh, having to be resorted to. Because how do you deal with misinformation today? No country is able to fig figure out. That is why the Singapore government has come up with these very tight restrictions on misinformation, which is why the Australians are doing it, which is why the Canadians are doing it. So I think it is time in India as well that we have a discussion around misinformation. We are certainly in the Digital India Act, the next step of the legislative framework for the, uh, for the digital space, going to have a whole section on misinformation. And I think that's a good time to have this conversation. If we figure out a way to make the internet safe and trusted, then there is lesser and less need for internet takedowns. But at the moment, the internet has as much of good stuff, truth, as it has misinformation. And we have to figure out a way or how to deal with it. I don't want to persist on that point. Obviously, as you say, there, is, there are concerns over disinformation as well, uh, and, and you know, uh, from all, all actors uh, in, in that field. But, and you also said you won't tell us your age. Um, I'm sure you're not old enough to forget your wedding anniversary, uh, which you're flying back to this evening. Uh, I just want to touch on the concept of artificial intelligence. And uh, the prime minister has said that you need a global regulatory framework on it. Uh, it's perhaps the most, the biggest challenge that we face today as we move forward. Uh, what's the thinking on that? Is there some shape for such a regulatory framework that's come? And from an India point of view, what would be the biggest concern? So AI, for example, again, like I said, uh, like the internet and like most of technology, uh, we believe AI is a force for good. Uh, we have uh, publicly said as a government that uh, 
uh, AI is a kinetic enabler of our digital economy, and we have a goal of a trillion dollar digital economy, and AI will be a significant part of that. Uh, the Prime Minister, way back in 2021, talked about India for AI and AI for India. So we are very heavily invested in artificial intelligence in terms of our digital economy. Now, having said that, like I said, you, if you marry misinformation and the threat of misinformation and the power of AI to take misinformation to another level altogether, which I have personal uh, experience of even during the Karnataka election, the deep fakes that are now coming out of the AI world are just way, way too good. You had Mamuti and Mohanlal play Godfather. Yeah, exactly. And, and that was still, in my opinion, a bit crude and rough around the edges. But there are sophisticated uh, uh, models today churning out deep fakes that are absolutely yeah. indistinguishable from the real stuff. So we, we, we have to figure out a framework where, like the rest of the internet, AI does not cause harm. And our initial approach to this, which you will see in the Digital India Act, is that we will regulate, if you want to call it the word regulation, but at least create the guardrails mm. for all of emerging technology through the prism of user harm. Mm. So in, in simple English, what this means is, we will say, look, you can innovate anything you want in AI, accepting your innovation cannot cause harm, mm. cannot cause criminality. And as long as you agree to that basic principle, you can create the next fanciest, spiffiest innovation. Yeah. So this is tentatively our approach. We don't want to be prescriptive. We don't want to say this you should not do, that you should not do, uh, which is cer certainly the way the Europeans are going. Uh, we have approached this. We will see during consultation what is the general feedback of the industry and the consumers to it, and then we'll move forward. You're making a very nuanced point. India's approach is not the way the Europeans are approaching the issue. Yeah, so our approach in the uh, privacy uh, side has been very different from the European GDPR. Uh, uh, the, the European uh, way of regulating the space is a lot more prescriptive. They go way into details and they say, you shall not do this, you shall not do that. I mean, it's, a, it's a slightly different approach. Ours is more principle-led. Okay. Ours is more citizen rights and citizen uh, and platform obligation led. So if you look at the GDPR and read the DPDP, you will see that this is a much different, uh, if I may say so, more elegant, more principle based, less prescriptive. Of course, that I'm saying it, so I'll say good things about the DPDP, of course. But the GDPR is not, I'm not saying it's bad or it's wrong, but they take a slightly different approach of being more prescriptive. Uh, they, I think they are signaling to the world that they want to be prescriptive in AI. And uh, what we are, at least at this stage, saying is that we want to be regulating all emerging technologies through the prism of our safety and trust goals of the internet and user harm. Yeah, you know, we may be walking into a world where you may be a deep fake, I may be a deep fake sitting and having a conversation here, or the real one could Absolutely. be somewhere else. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, my. Moving forward from AI and uh, digital data protection, uh, coming to some policy decisions that the center had taken in terms of the ban on laptops uh, from outside and, and you know, the, it's been deferred. What's the intention behind the move? There seems to be still lack of clarity in terms of communication and a lot of concerns raised by manufacturing <clears throat> giants. So there is no ban. So first of all, I just want to be, be very clear up front. There is no ban, there is no licensing, there is no license Raj. Uh, unfortunately, I think the communication of what we did wasn't uh, the, the best and the most perfect. So I think all of the spin then walked into the vacuum and then started p positioning this as licensing Raj and license Raj and et cetera. It is none of the above. I'll explain to you what our thinking is. The Indian digital ecosystem is, is at an inflection point. We think the next three to five years, the Demand for digital devices, whether they are smartphones or laptops or servers for data centers that power the cloud, is going to exponentially go up. Now, as a responsible government, we want to make sure that everything that goes into the Indian uh, internet, ranging from an IoT sensor to a server that is powering a cloud, to a laptop, to a tablet, to a smartphone, are all trusted, trusted devices. And therefore, we don't want equipment coming into the country which is anything other than being trusted. Now, therefore, 
there is a and in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in this particular context i want to clarify that most of the servers and most of the laptops are manufactured in one geography and i won't say the country's name but you certainly get what i mean and therefore we don't want that dependence we want don't want that strategic concentration uh, of all of these digital devices that are coming into our country and digital building a digital ecosystem and network uh, to come from anything other than trusted sources so what we are telling the industry is that this is not a licensing raj this is an import management system whose only goal is that we want in india bought into india imported into india made in india only stuff that is trusted by us okay and as a as an extension of that conversation we are saying look why don't you manufacture in india because then you certainly trusted mm -hmm. or if you are wanting to import it we'll certainly figure out where you can import it but you should import it from a trusted source mm -hmm. that is the net sum and substance of what we are attempting to do unfortunately i think the way it came out it wasn't communicated uh correctly and uh, that happens otherwise we do not do anything and the gov this government will certainly not do anything that is even remotely disruptive of the growth of our digital economy that is an absolute promise and uh, that is not just my promise it is a commitment from our prime minister and but at the same time we have an absolute obligation and an important obligation to make sure what comes into our indian internet what comes into the digital ecosystem of india is uh, is trusted equipment trusted devices trusted sourced uh, uh, equipment and by the way this conversation goes into 5g baseband radio it goes into nbiot types of radio uh, modules so this conversation is not just limited to these three four categories it's a broader conversation and we don't want to be in the position of many western countries today who are already up the curve and then find that 80% of all their equipment is from sources that are very dubious right so well we are planning for the future we are planning this as a very important part of our future so it's not an economic decision it's a security concern it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a future of our internet future of our digital ecosystem consideration okay. around trusted equipment and trusted uh, products and a last couple of questions to you and i want to uh, speak about something you've been passionately involved about which is the semicon space the semiconductor space now this is a globally extremely competitive space with countries like the us offering uh, you know you've obviously got micron to sign up in gujarat uh, is that is that space too difficult for india to compete in are we wasting too many resources no there? look uh, first of all i i will certainly tell you not because i'm a, a Uh, you know a junior minister in the uh, modi government or the modi team i will certainly tell you that there is nothing today in the tech space that is difficult for india mm -hmm. first of all that has to be very clearly understood this is a country that is today building ins vikrant with the electronic and sensor capability that can match or outmatch anything that is sailing uh, anywhere on on the seas this is a country that has taken a complex project like chandrayaan 3 and executed it conceived it built it uh, executed it over four years this country today is building chips designing chips that are powering our uh, vikram lander mm -hmm. uh, you know the chips yeah, were yeah. designed in india by the space application center and manufactured in the semiconductor complex limited in mohali so i think for a minute to believe that there is something that is not doable for india is not to understand where we have reached in the last 9 years but semiconductor fabs are a are a holy grail in a sense of it's an intersection of science and engineering science and technology at the ultimate level it is very 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 complex science it is very complex engineering and it is the ultimate in manufacturing and science and engineering and everything combined mm. and we are having to do all of this after 65 years or 70 years of doing nothing about it so i think we should understand this is a medium to long term game mm -hmm. we didn't do anything for the 65 years we are trying to do in the next 10 years what china tried to do in 30 years spent 200 billion dollars and and failed mm. and we are trying to do this in the next 10 years so we will get there I have i have absolute confidence that with this type of clarity strategic clarity of our prime minister we will certainly get to fabs but before that we will be doing a number of equally exciting things in packaging innovation we will be doing a number of exciting things in designing next generation chips 
uh, out of Indian startups and Indian companies working in partnership or without partnership with foreign companies. So we will certainly be in the next few years making a significant mark yeah. on the semiconductor supply chains and value chains that we were absent from, from 65, 70 years. You're a confident man with all these, uh, this ones. I hope you'll be confident when you meet your wife this evening. What are you planning to get for her? First of all, I have to break the bad news that I'm not going to meet her this evening. So that is, uh, <laughs> so that's the uh, thing. But I will certainly catch up with her on 29th for Onam. Okay. And uh, I'll be with family for Onam. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Rajiv, for taking thank time you, out. Thank you.